Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli, and with me today, of course, is Peter Lavelle, host of um, Artie's talk show Crosstalk, as well as uh, co-founder of uh, The Gaggle. Uh, today, a fairly interesting article appeared in the Washington Post. Um, its author is someone uh, called Robert Wright. And now, I don't know whether uh, listeners to the gaggle are familiar with him. He is um, a writer who um, many years ago was editor of the New Republic. Uh, he's also written some books about um, uh, biology, evolution, and so on. Um, this article is extremely long and reads very much like um, articles in the old New Republic. I don't know whether anyone remembers them because I haven't read the New Republic uh, in a number of years, but they were in that genre of somebody making a hair splitting distinction between one thing which was good, namely the author himself, and bad, uh, which was some other author or magazine or whatever. So what used to happen in the New Republic is that there was a neoliberal foreign policy interventionism a la the New Republic, which was good, which had to be distinguished from the neoconservative foreign policy intervention in commentary magazine, which was bad. So this was this is the uh, genre within which this article appears. Uh, he's the, the author is trying to distinguish between a progressive idealism, which he considers as bad. He thinks that this is the um, uh, the kind of thinking that pervaded Obama and now will pervade uh, the incoming Biden administration, as opposed to progressive realism, which to which he subscribes, and and that is of course good. Once you get through the the verbiage, it doesn't look that there's a huge amount of difference between the two, but he seems to think that there is. Um, and while he takes all sorts of reasonable pot shots against the, the blunders and incompetence of the Biden team, who were of course all members of the um, Obama administration, um, when he talks about what he stands for, it sounds very similar to what they stand for. So the only thing that's interesting about this and what I think is worth discussing is that there is at least some measure of uh, critique on the liberal left of the kind of um, foreign policy that we should expect um, to come in to force with the arrival of the uh, Biden team. Uh, what was your take, Peter? Well, I, I agree with you. It, it's very, very long. It, it's very wordy. Um, I, I think it's um, uh, artificially, I mean, like it's, you know, when people pull out of th uh, thesaurus, you know, to try to impress you, okay? I mean, all right, fine. I mean, if you can't say it in simple words, it means you don't understand it. Um, the, the, the value of the article is a, a little sliver of self-reflection, which is so rare from these people, so rare. I mean, what I would say to Mr. Wright, I mean, you can, you can come up with all your terms and sound really highfalutin and smart and all that. But at the end of the day, whatever term or verbiage you're using, the people on the receiving end don't see a difference, okay? <laughs> they don't see a difference at all, okay? And on, another thing is, is that he, the, this author, and I think so many of these people in this foreign policy blob, um, they, they, they cannot with um, clarity really define what the national interest is. They throw that around a lot, but they're, they're never very specific about it. And I think they're very, I, I think there's a reason for it because it has to be very elastic, okay? Because basically what they want, if it's progressive or idealistic, or what, they want hegemony and, and that's it, okay? That's the simple word. Right. And, and so, you know, there's this, intuitively there's a claim, a demand for, for hegemony, but they never explain why that is in the national interest. And that's why American foreign policy is so screwed up, all right? Because is it in, it's in the uh, national interest to punish your allies, European countries for developing their own energy strategy, which, oh, includes Russia. Okay, is that in the national interest or is that in corporate interest? Okay, they never really want to talk about those things. Also in the article, before I forget, 
It's riveted with mistakes. Okay. Okay. I mean, he gets Ukraine wrong. He gets Crimea wrong. He gets uh, uh, Syria wrong in a really big way, almost in, in a, um, um, a, a duplicitous way, the way I look at it. Um, and of course, Libya. Okay. So, I mean, Even given the authors. About Bosnia, go ahead, jump in. Bosnia wrong. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But see, Whatever term you want to put into this, it's again not question the the veracity of intervention. Okay, it's always like I used to explain to um, when I used to give um, um, master classes in, in, in journalism. It's it's kind of like you know the, how American media and the foreign policy. Um, blob work, you know, it's like, it's not if the United States should at attack Iran, it's when they should attack. They, they, it's all obviously assumed that it's right to attack, okay? And so, they, I, I don't know, if he, did he use the term right to protect? Because he doesn't do that, but he No, yeah, he was, dan but he was dancing around it. Right, but that's the thing, that he kind of says, well, people like me, the progressive realists, you know, we aren't the sort of the realists, the bad realists. In other distinct, the bad of the Kissingerians or the, um, and I guess he doesn't talk about Trump, but I mean, I guess he'd refer to Trump. They don't pay attention to international law and international institutions, whereas we do. But then that's it. You have now provided the rationale. This has always been the rationale of interventionism, because what they say about interventionism is not, hey, let's go into uh, Libya to topple uh, Gaddafi. They say, well, we've got to worry about the co consequences of not intervening, because if we don't intervene, then there will be a genocide, or there'll be mass refugee flows, instability all over the world, so we have to arrest it. That's exactly the argument. So he Yeah, but, the, but all those interventions make that happen. Of course it does. Of course it does. That's why the distinction that he draws is, again, a complete, it's a distinction without a difference. That's exactly the rationale. And that was the rationale used in 1999 when, when NATO uh, bombed Yugoslavia. Well, if we don't do it, there will be terrible instability. There'll be refugee flows. And God knows what happens in Europe once all these uh, millions of refugees arrive. That's it. That's exactly the, the whole point of what he's arguing. And the author also, in a very convoluted way, to be honest with you, I, I, I couldn't um, determine really what he understood about the e efficacy of international law. I mean, he, 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 he posit, it, it posits it as a good, and then he just kind of wanders away. <laughs> and uh, I, I was just wondering, well, you, are you going to, because that's where I stand. See, right. you can put idealism, progressive, you know, all these things here, but I am ad adamant about it. International law is the level playing field, okay? And and then and you have to say and and everyone should do that. Large countries and small. That's why we have it, right. okay? And so and again, when you look at the foreign policy blob, and I don't care what administration it is, they are very prickly about international law. I mean, they, remember the um, uh, hot mic that uh, um, uh, uh, Secretary of State Kerry, when he was discussing with Lavrov on Syria, he said, you know, we're here illegally, you know, okay? I mean, he, he, they, but you would never say, that would never be said, okay? Right. I'm right. sorry, in Syria, to make the it's clear. And, 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 and what you just said is, is absolutely essential because at the very heart of international law, is national sovereignty. There it is. It's in the Charter of the United Nations. It's, you know, uh, Article 2 of the United Nations, national sovereignty. Absolutely no threat of, to use force against any other uh, member state. Absolutely no intervention in the internal affairs of uh, member states. That's it. It is the heart of international law. So, of course, they, when they, as you said, he brings up international law and then he kind of becomes this vague, nebulous thing of, you know, arresting, uh, you know, weapons proliferation in outer space or whatever. No, it means precisely you don't intervene in the internal affairs of other uh, states. And of course, somebody like him cannot accept that. Yeah, well, and he says that, you know, people like himself don't like uh, meddling in country, uh, I'm using my words here, meddling in the internal affairs of other countries. Well, that's part of the DNA of American foreign policy in, uh, in um, uh, wanting and demanding hegemony. You have to, if you want hegemony, you have to do that through hook or crook, okay? And that is considered a positive. You know, if we can't do it, you know, one way we'll do it another because the goal is always um, virtuous. Well, no, I mean, the means that you apply determine the virtue of the goal, 
all right? And, and, and that's something the foreign policy blob does not want to recognize. They don't want to recognize the cruelty, the suffering, and the law of unintended consequence, which he actually mentioned in his article here, which of course, and that was early on, I thought, well, maybe there's, this is be a thread I can pull through this article. No, it just kind of, you know, kind of like fog just kind of goes away here. Yeah. Um, what, what I found is it, it was almost kind of childish in looking for differences, okay? Because I, like you, I, I think this is verbiage. It, it, it's, uh, it, it's looking for differences where they aren't there. And for some reason, he's kind of cheerleading certain individuals. Okay, everybody gets to shit on Henry Kissinger. Fine, okay, wow. You really scored a point there, did you? Okay, I, I mean, I just thought that was so cheap, you know? And it has nothing to do with what's going on now and what could happen. Right, right. No, that, that, that's exactly right. And of course, as with these kinds of cheap shots, uh, it doesn't actually even get to the essence of what a realist uh, foreign policy looks like, because a realist foreign policy says, well, we have to pursue our own national interests. And that means we're not the president of uh, the Soviet Union. We're not, as in the, in the days of the Kissinger, we're not the president of Ukraine. We have to worry about the American people and what's in their interest. And he, does, he never addresses that because that's really the gravamen of the, uh, the realist critique, whether it's uh, Kissinger, Morgenthau, Walter Lippmann, uh, George Kennan, they said no open-ended commitments on human rights and democracy because they don't actually serve the interests of Americans and lead to all sorts of deleterious consequences. Yeah, and, and, and the way this author here, right, Mr. Wright, and, and others in the media, they try to create this false binary, okay? Um, if, if, uh, um, if you want to, if you, you can be a realist fine in the national interest, but it's at the expense of humanity. Well, no, that's virtue signaling, okay? Because as we've already argued in this video here, your interventions do cause the harm, okay? Do cause the harm. Right. And, and, and because you create, you, you have these captured elites that will actually do your bidding to invade. An, a, a, I mean, I, a number of times when we did um, a Venezuela on crosstalk, I would have these, these arch, arch conservatives, and I would ask them, so do you want the United States to invade your country? And of course, they stumble all over themselves. But basically, yeah, because they'll come in, topple the government, and I'll be sitting on the throne. Yeah. And, and that, that goes with Libya, it goes with Syria, it goes with Ukraine. Right, right. It goes on and on. Okay, right. they right. have these captured elites here, and they're not—they're not pursuing the national interests of their own countries because what they're doing is they're pursuing the hegemonic drive of the Washington consensus. And that's why what that was what was so um, weak about this article, disappointing, weak, pathetic, whatever word you want to use, is that he ultimately doesn't take the the only consistent position that you can take, which is no interventionism under any circumstances and for whatever reason. Because once you allow interventionism, there's always going to be some reason. Someone's going to come up with, oh, well, because, hey, we don't do it because all these poor people are going to starve. All these poor people will be massacred. There'll be refugee flows. I'll be here all- Child literacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's going to be 10 million different reasons to that. So unless you rule it out and say none, no, under no circumstances, <laughs> we will we intervene. You know, if, if even starving children come, you know, banging on our windows, we still won't intervene. Only then can we can we talk seriously about international law and foreign policy realism. All the rest is just, uh, you know, hair splitting and trying to and do the virtue signaling. Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not really against interventionism. I'm just against. The, the interventions that fail. Well, anyone can be against an intervention that fails. It's the next <laughs> intervention that counts, not, not the one that's gone. Yeah, of course, sure. everyone can be against Iraq and Libya after they've already been shown to be fiasco. It's it's so absolutely right. I, I'm against failure. I'm against those interventions. But this time, here we go, those the six words. This time it will be different. No, yes. it won't be because you don't learn from your mistakes because your foreign policy is driven by the demand of he he hegemonic control. And you and, and until, up until you reassess that that underlying assumption, you're gonna to continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. And in doing so, the infrastructure of the United States is collapsing. You have the middle class collapsed, past tense, 
collapsed, okay? And you have the, the, the maybe just the little scintilla that he could have actually developed on is this the the the, the role of technology in in future uh, um, uh, uh, foreign affairs and diplomacy. I thought that was kind of interesting. I would have thought you know you kind of run with it because that's the only thing you've said interesting in this article. Oh, I, um, I agree. Yeah. yeah, that that was the one the one thing that he said interesting, which is that these uh, it, was, it was a good criticism, which is that these progressive idealists who profess to address these international issues like uh, pandemics, uh, climate change, uh, uh, nuclear proliferation, weapons in outer space, which of course require international cooperation and said, well, hey, if you want international cooperation, you can't then start dividing the world up between authoritarian states and democratic states. I mean, there's an obvious contradiction there. And I think he, you know, he, he did well in, in pointing out <laughs> the absurdity of that progressive idealist position. Well, uh, when when uh, um, uh, 70 plus, maybe, not, maybe 80 plus uh, percent of Trump supporters believe that the election was stolen. So I don't know what kind of democracy you're talking right. about. I always find that really just really, I mean, it's only people, it's in think tank land and it's in Washington DC, the beltway. They, they use these terms democracy, which is just absolutely absurd, okay? I mean, absolutely absurd. It's not for democracy. It's for a lot of other reasons, but not that. And, it, and, and I would even, I would even um, make the claim because empirically it's true. It's not for humanity either because the, these foreign policies kill a lot of people, destroy a lot of futures. And you know what, George, create, Blowback. Right, right. No, no, no. <laughs> that, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, does anyone really believe, does anyone in Venezuela who one moment believes that the United States is motivated by promoting a democracy in Venezuela? I mean, you know, when you think of the Latin American countries and all of the interventions by the United States over the decades, um, and again, you know, the, the foreign policy blob always say, yeah, yeah, well, those are really bad interventions, but the next intervention will be for democracy. Yeah, it's true we overthrew Allende, it's true. Yeah, but it's kind of like saying there's a bad good. abortion and a good abortion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But next time, next time, it will be for democracy. You know, one of the things that, you know, just that comes to mind here is that you and I remember um, in the 1970s, um, you had all these military dictatorships in Latin America, um, almost through the country. Yeah. And, um, and they, they, the mantra was, you know, must bring democracy, must bring democracy and, and, and throw out these juntas, okay? Well, it happened. But then, oh no, the people voted the wrong way. <laughs> you were supposed to vote differently. And now has this been drive to get rid of any kind of uh, indigenous democratic tradition? You know, you, you, know, you, you, you can look at Venezuela, and, you know, my, my attitude is this, is that, you know, that's what they made for themselves, okay? And tens of millions of people have been brought out of poverty. Tens of millions of people are more are literate now. Um, I, I don't see what's, pro what's the problem with that agenda there, okay? Is, is there a mode of governance and the, the mode of economic control of the economy? That's up to them. I don't understand why the United States or other countries should weigh in on that, okay? Right. Weigh in, why, why, okay? No, that, it's I, a sovereign country. It's up to them to decide. And if some leader decides to make a constitutional change at the last minute in order to be able to run for another term, that's up to them to decide. If they don't like it, you know, then you know, let, let them make their feelings heard. But the idea, oh, well, he's making a, a last minute constitutional change. That, that, that's not democratic. We need to intervene. We need to impose sanctions. No, again, no interventionism any, under any circumstances. That's the only consistent uh, uh, foreign policy position that you can have. Well, I mean, that's like that's like Beijing right. weighing in on the election. It's like, well, we're very concerned about how Pennsylvania ran their election here. OK, I mean, we really we need to bring this to the United Nations Security Council and discuss right. signatures. OK, and voter ID. OK, mm -hmm. because democracy is being being threatened in the world and that the epicenter of that danger is in the United States. Let's call an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council to discuss Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Absolutely. That's exactly what the United States does. Absolutely. You know, if I, if I were um, a, a leader of the Chinese, that is exactly what I would do. I would go to the United Nations and say, look, I'm very, very troubled by, you know, they made these last minute changes. It says in the co state constitution that it has to be done by the state legislature, and then it has to be a constitutional change. 
This was all done arbitrarily by the court and by the governor. This is unacceptable, you know, because democracy is inseparable. You know, humanity cares about, you know, humanity. That's what I, I would certainly do. I mean, well, I mean, you, again, using the same logic, you know, when Chad uh, or Chop or whatever it was in Washington state, maybe China would think it's important to intervene there to restore order, okay? Because the order has broken down. Um, uh, there's no um, uh, civil society is collapsing. There is no um, uh, domestic policing. Um, but, but see, that's what the argument the US, that, that's why we went into Panama, okay? <laughs> okay, or Grenada, okay? Yeah. And, and we, we're very worried about the consequences because we might have a refugee flow you know you know americans by the the tens of thousands might start arriving on our doorstep and you know that might cause instability in china we, we're very worried about this absolutely anybody can play this game and i think you know i think it's a, unfortunate that that other countries haven't learned to do this you know america wants to do this we're going to do it we're, we're going to intervene we're going to say how yeah this affects us you know don't say this is all an internal affair no no it affects us that's the american you know, you play others Maybe just a parting thought here. One of the things I think uh, things about that article that made me kind of laugh is that um, even though the, the writer is slightly critical of Tony Blinken and and uh, and Jake Sullivan, but you know, it, it, for me, um, it, again, this is this um, accreditation that you know, and the, the uh, managerial professional class is you know, I mean, he's slightly critiquing him when. <laughs> The, the their their resumes are 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 a train wreck okay but he's just kind of slightly massaging it and trying to show there is a difference between us no mr Wright there is no difference because the result is not different you can dress it up all you want with right to protect and progressive idealism and all you know this is mumbo jumbo this is really mumbo jumbo and it shows people that want to be influencers on foreign policy don't have a clue in what they're talking about okay it's an in group and you're not a member of it that's right exactly he's an in group so he says yeah well, I think you made some good criticisms of my position, and I will take it on board. Oh, good, oh, good. Now let's go get a drink. I mean, that, that's it exactly. So it's not a it's not a really a principal critique. So yeah, I was for the Libya intervention at the early stage, but I was kind of against it when when again. Anybody, anybody would have known that the moment that first bomb landed on Libya, that this was going to be a massive regime change operation. You had to be an idiot not to know that that's exactly what was NATO intended. This, and, and we're still living with the consequences now. And old Jake is going to be back to finish off the job, huh? Okay, finish off the job in Syria. I mean, th this is madness here. It's absolutely madness. See, the, the, you know, this is what I'm about to say is very naive. But you know, considering the disaster of the Obama administration and before that, the Bush administration, you have three election cycles now of, uh, of the public saying enough of these wars here. You know, Joe, you know, if he had his faculties here and he wanted to make a name for himself, he could have said, he could say, look, we're going to have a change of direction here and we're going to fix the country here. But the, the, the foreign, you know, the interagency consensus, he's not going to touch that because the last guy that touched it, they, 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 they literally ran him out. Okay. So th th this is what it is, is it, it's a, a mindset that is it's so pervasive. And as we started our video, is that there's no self-reflection. There's just congratulatory, you know, patting on the back, you know, slightly disagree with you, but you know, we're essentially on the same page, all this kind of nonsense, okay? It is fake. It is a fake argument. It is, it, it, it's a fake narrative is what this article the, is. The word, exactly, and the worst example of that was of course, uh, Obama, who I think we agree is one of the worst presidents ever, who runs in 2008, his one credential is, well, I was against the Iraq war, uh, you know, we, I, I'm against stupid wars. First thing he does, he appoints Hillary Clinton Secretary, Secretary of State. Second thing, he gets involved in Libya. And then of course he then makes his critique. Yeah, well, you know, maybe we got Libya wrong. A bit bloody late. <laughs> and, 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 and then, but he blames Sarkozy and, and yeah, Cameron, yeah, right? Remember? Sarkozy, exactly. Not, nothing to do with him. Like, you know, classical. Oh, oh, oh. Everything is always somebody else's fault.
skip. Uh, no. You know, we were leading from behind. Oh, my God, this is just such fiction, okay? I mean, the, the, the air power of the French and the British, okay, it can inflict damage, but not like the American Air Force, okay? And, you know, basically, it was supposed to be a no-fly zone, and the U.S. broke that resolution. By the way, that was it. I mean, anybody could have seen that. The moment, I mean, the, they had passed the resolution, which was simply about, you know, uh, protecting uh, civilians, boom, you know, within minutes, the, the first missile landed. And as soon as that missile landed, you knew what was intended. I mean, how can anyone think of anything other than that? I mean, that, oh, that way- but, have, but George, Gaddafi was giving his soldiers Viagra, remember? God, the, the lengths they went. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's, uh, we will, of course, be uh, maintaining our laser-like focus on the, uh, the foreign policy uh, team uh, surrounding uh, Biden and, of course, on everything else. Thank you very much, Peter. And remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.